that shit. Welcome to Trash Talk MMA. Now my face behind my back and talk trash. The number one podcast for news and insight that matters in the world of mixed martial arts. <laughs> Brought to you live and unfiltered punk. from all four corners of the globe That's what you said. by MMA aficionado Antoine Pelchay. Yo, and welcome to the Trash Talk MMA podcast. I'm your host, Antoine Pelche, and today I have a very special guest in the house, Mr. Isaac Kensington, better known as MMA documentary maker and filmmaker, Genghis Khan. Isaac, how you doing, buddy? Good. You, man? Excellent. Well, it's cool, man. Uh, thank you for coming back. Uh, we tried this one time, and I had a difficulty with the mic. We lost the recording, so we got to come back and, uh, and outdo ourselves this time around. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, lots to talk about. Uh, you're in Phuket right now, and you're putting together and launching uh, Phuket Dreaming Season 2 for Phuket Top Team. Tell us a little bit about that. All right, season 1, We got, I, I came out here originally to film Phuket Dreaming. It's like a series on basically all the fighters that live and train in Thailand that like come out here to like live full time and also their lifestyles and everything that goes behind it. And like season one did pretty good and yeah, we're just starting on season two. And season two was like, uh, we got a lot of new fighters on it, like it's Thiago Tavares, we got some K1 guys down here. We got uh, Cyrus Washington, AKA Black Dynamite, Rob Lacita will be on it, uh, Junie Browning, It'd be a lot of, a lot of new characters, plus with a lot of the old ones, and Luke, Luke also. So when Phuket, how, how did, what was Phuket Dreamer, what was its original purpose? Like who came up with the idea for the show? Like originally we, uh, Boyd, Boyd Clark, the owner of uh, Phuket Top Team, he came to me with the idea that like he wanted to shoot a series like anything, something similar to 24-7 and something similar to like my old Miami Hustle shows. But here in Phuket, surrounded about like a, centered around his team, okay. like, uh, his fight team. How did he know about you just by, uh, he just was a fan of your work or what? Mostly Rob Lucita, like he was a fan of my work before and he like showed Boyd, he was showing Boyd for a while and Boyd was like got into it and they uh, they had hired originally a guy to come do it at first but it didn't work out and then uh, they contacted me a couple years ago and we've been trying to work out some stuff and finally Booster like jumped in and they helped sponsor the whole series and that helped get the whole thing put together. Cause yeah, it did pretty good. It did pretty good numbers, right? Like, what did yeah. what did how what did how did that work for you? How did that work for Phuket Top Team? Is that something that really expanded your exposure? Yeah, like uh, it got like a lot of good numbers for the season one. Like a lot of views. Like a lot of people seen it, and everybody like the fighters got popular, more popular, bigger sponsors. Yep. Uh, main events and stuff like that. And Boyd, the Top Team gym, they also got a lot of more like customers and fighters, and a lot of more pro fighters want to come out and train at Phuket Top Team because of the series. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty cool because it actually highlights a lot of what you can do outside of the gyms here. I think there's yeah. a lot of videos that get put out by, by gyms that are out here, and then you see what it is like to train there, but there's not a lot showing on what's going on outside, and I think it's one of the really cool things about Phuket, this island, is it's pretty small, but there's all sorts of activities that you can do across it, and I think you probably tend to highlight a lot of that, right? Yeah, yeah, we like to show what's going on outside of like Phuket, so like people, if they come, they can see what it's like to live here, like kind of like as a local and see all the activities, how beautiful the place is, and and also the training, so you get everything in one package pretty much. Now, had you been out here before? Uh, before no. doing Phuket Dreaming One? No, this is my first time coming out. Like, okay. I came. So, but I mean, you you did did you do Phuket Dreaming One as well? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you did come out here for that, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I've been here since. Like, I haven't left yet. So, like. Uh, oh, okay. So I've been here for almost a year now. Like in a month, it'll be a year. As you did back to okay, yeah, awesome. I didn't realize that. I thought you actually did season one, Went left, home. came back. All right, well, it happens to a lot of people, right? You yeah, know? after this season, I'm going home like in a month and a half, basically. Okay. So, Phuket Dream in Season 2, you're, what, two episodes deep on YouTube yeah. at the time of this recording? And the third episode should be coming in like the next two weeks, should be released. Okay. How's the response been so far? So far, it's been good. Like, a lot of people like the new season. They're enjoying, like, Cyborg and Jay-Z. Yep. Some of the same old characters, and the new ones are going to start being introduced into the next episode. Okay. Awesome. So let's uh, let's let's do a little uh, a little roll back through time here. Um, how did you get involved, uh, you know, with filmmaking? Like, where did, where did that originate from? Originally, I was just editing, and I was doing like a lot of highlight reels, and I was working for a few like fighters and companies like that, doing like Is something highlights. you went to school for. Or? No, I actually just I went to school for football. I was playing football, and like during my college time, I became like an MMA fan. Okay. And that's when I just started like I fell in love with the sport and started like started editing, and. Yeah, I just got caught up in it pretty so much. So you were just having fun, or were you trying to fill a need that you 
like that that wasn't there like were you like hey nobody's really trying to do some highlight reels for these guys like what was the initial inspiration uh was uh, my initial inspiration was i was trying to introduce the sport to my brother like and okay. the rest of my family and i wanted them to like watch some of the fighters and like just watch some highlight reels and like get involved and like I yeah because when you speak is when you try to introduce somebody to mma it's not Showing them entire fights isn't always yeah. the best way to go because they don't they don't, they don't always the program, resonate. Yeah. Well, they don't yeah, or they can be too long, or there's yeah. the, you can have a boring fight. So of course, a highlight reel is always a great way to introduce people into stuff. So um, so you put together these highlight reels to get your friends and family kind of on board. Yeah, like I was like wanted to show them Anderson Silva and like Melvin Manoff and some like Matt Hughes and stuff like that. But the highlight reels had like horrible music that I didn't like. They they couldn't get down to like yeah. They put it on, they would like blank out within like ten seconds after watching. So I just would just switch the music. And that was it, just so they can watch them. And then okay. from then on, I got into like editing. What what sort of uh what sort of setup did you have technically? Uh, Sony Vegas, and that was about it. Just Sony Vegas. You still using that? Yeah, still using the same thing. Excellent. <laughs> so over the over the years, obviously, you've become a well known name, uh, particularly within I guess you could say the the MMA underground. Um, what are some of the what are some of the videos that put you on the map? Uh, I think maybe the the Grand Theft Grand Theft title highlights which was like a it was like a knockoff of the grand theft auto the video game but like showing like a fighter who would like steal the title from whoever the champ was okay it's just like a cartoon type highlight reel all right and that one like got me like the most views that i had when i was doing highlights and that like helped me like kept pushing out more highlights after that now it seems like you have uh, a couple types of work like you you do these almost like these profiles of specific fighters you know like for fedor or for madhoff etc and then you also do this documentary style work. Which which one do you gravitate towards the most? I mean, it seems like the, the, the documentary style stuff has kind of taken over the highlight reels, no? Yeah, the documentary stuff. Because more when I'm filming, it's better to do like the documentary style stuff because I can tell a story. It's more like doing like a movie type for me. Like it's building towards like doing a like a full length documentary movie style of uh, of filming. But when I'm editing, I still do highlight reels for people and stuff like that. But it's not as much as it's not as much for me anymore. Like, well, and also, you get, this probably allows you to control the content a lot better. Yeah, you know, you, you get to film it, you get to pick it, edit yeah. it, and you you own all the content. I mean, yeah. how's that work? Yeah, I own all the content. Okay, yeah, so that's much, huge. Yeah, film, edit it, and put it all together. So it's like, it's a lot better for me that way than the highlights. Highlights is just a lot of other people's content. Me putting that together and, and then send it to them. So when you started putting together, you know, whatever, either your own documentaries and your own uh, your own highlight reels. How are you going about promoting these things? How did because you, you've garnered a good following? How, how did you go about growing that? Before I used to just post on the forums and just like just uh, on all the MMA forums I can find like Sure Dog, the okay. and MMA Weekly and stuff, and just post up links to the videos and like let people. So you just say, hey guys, I just did yeah. a tribute to Fighter X, whatever. Check yeah. it out, and then you'd have it up on YouTube. Yeah, they'd start checking out, comment about it, and pass so, it around and like word of mouth type shit. Okay, because I've never really been that good at marketing like myself being a marketer and doing all that type of stuff because it's kind of hard to do everything at the same time yeah, man. it's its own it's its own gig man you know yeah. so basically we don't ask marketers to make the movie but sometimes we ask the movie maker to be his market his own marketer you know yeah, and it's like hey man it's its own gig you know yeah so at what point did you feel like hey i'm gaining some traction here there's actually a bit of a following people are starting to recognize my name they're recognizing my work they're giving me some props on it at what point did you say hey let's make this a career uh when i got hit up by the ifl like when they were around Okay. And they wanted me to work for them like full time doing like highlight reels and intros and stuff like that. So that must have been pretty cool. Yeah, Who'd you get a call from for that? I don't remember the guy's name. Yeah. But it was like a long time ago and like I used to work directly with them and I used to do a lot of they used to have me do a lot of like my own highlights, but just like with IFL fighters. Okay. And then like promo stuff for like their T V shows and stuff like that. Excellent. And that was pretty cool because it was like good money at the time and I was able to stop working regular job and just do highlights. So between the time that you started doing this as a hobby and then you started actually getting paid for it, how many years of kind of paying your dues did uh, you put in? Like maybe a year and a half, two years. Okay. Like actually, that's not too bad. Highlights. Yeah, they, they, they contacted me like pretty quick. And then, you know, it'll, MMA work was always off and on. Like you'll have something for a little while and then yeah, something yeah. else pop up or, you know. So a lot of your films, I mean, wh wh what's the one that's garnered the most views like what in your opinion is the movie that's or the, the film that you've put together documentary that's been the most successful um miami hustle okay. the original miami hustle was like when we first put that out the first couple episodes were like really like really popular they were blowing up and got like a lot of hits real fast and like so what was the premise behind that and how did that come together that was like uh that came together it was just like 
four fighters in uh, Miami who all trained at like American Top Team, Jay-Z, Calvin Conte, George Santiago, George Masvidal, and Alexis Villa. Yep. And it was just like uh, centered around them, their training, that top team, their strength and conditioning, and like just living and partying in Miami. And that came because I came down there originally because I had just like just bought my camera and everything. like, And I came down to Miami to just like uh, contacted Masvidal yep. to do like a just like a quick like five minute like documentary style piece on him right for his fight with Paul Daly and it was like after his fight when I got up there and when I got up there Jay-Z was there training and stuff like that and then I ended up doing something with Jay-Z and then like uh when I as soon as I left they 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 had called me and told me they wanted to try and do something bigger like something that we can put together and like try to like make a series on or something yeah it sounds like pretty early on you forged some really strong ties with the guys at American Top Team right yeah and you started in Atlanta yeah, I started in Atlanta at American Top Team with uh, Rafael Sunsau okay. and Douglas Lima. Yep. They were the, like the first ones I was filming with, and they all like were connected with Manu and too, who's out of Atlanta too, and Jukau. They were all together, so it was like that's how I got my base. And then I ended up going to Miami, and I ended up working with Jukau in Miami as well. Okay. He should be out here soon. And oh, he's uh, coming out to, uh, yeah, to Phuket. To Phuket, he should be out here soon. Excellent. Uh, should be on the new season of Phuket Dream, and him and Douglas Lima. Oh, very cool. Okay, so you, you obviously still have good ties with the guys at ATT? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, still good. Now, I think one of the things that fascinates people, too, about what you've been able to accomplish is how, how much you've sort of infiltrated the, the personal lives of these professional athletes. And uh, there's, you know, me just doing these podcasts up here, I've, you know, I've, I, it just stuns me how accessible, you know, some of these guys are. And, you know, they're pro athletes fighting in 1FC and Bellator and, and in UFC. And these are people who you can just pretty much, you know, cost in the street. <laughs> Have a drink with, yeah. and they'll, they'll they'll you know they'll get in your movie. They'll they'll, they'll jump. They'll, they'll provide you with footage you might want to put together a you know a highlight reel of them, etc. Or they'll come in and do a podcast. What's your experience being like with that? Yeah, like most of my fighters are pretty humble people. Like they don't think of themselves as too big or too big for anything like that. They like they're really open to like letting somebody come in and like help promote them because it's helping promote them at the same time as it's helping me out. And they like uh, I don't know. I never really met any fighters who are just like. Yeah, it's not like they have yeah, publicists and shit, yeah, right? Have, like, yeah, it's not <laughs> like know? in other sports where they got yeah, publicists and all this stuff behind them. In order to get to the fighter or get in contact with them, you have to yeah. do like a MMA. You can just hit him up on Facebook or see him in the street, like you said, and talk to him. And yeah, and it's sponsor. weird, and I, I don't really know why. I don't know if it's just because there's just less money in the hands of athletes maybe in MMA so they don't get these huge heads around them. I'm sure that like if I'm sure if yeah. maybe we wanted to, you know, get access to Chuck Liddell or something like that, it might harder. not quite be the same <laughs> thing. But what's interesting is that, you know, guys like Masvidal, Jay Z, I mean these guys have fought huge fights. Yeah. Uh, you know, Rob Lasita, he's got a big fight coming up. Uh, you know, if you're working with Douglas Lima, he's a Bellator champ, you know, they're truly, you know, highest level fighters out there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I had Rob on the show, the same thing. And the guys just, they just show up and, and they, they, they open themselves up like a book. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's an interesting case study, I think, of being like, why are MMA fighters such open and humble individuals? Yeah. I don't know if humble is the right word because not all these guys are humble, but that's part of the character. We're not looking for, uh, we're not looking for humility from them anyways. But I think it's just that accessibility that really makes... Something yeah. about this sport truly unique, you know? And when I say, like, humble, I mean, like, with the the media attention and stuff like that, they're not, like, yeah. big-headed towards, like, fans and, like, signing autographs and stuff like that. Yeah, like, I think in our case, you know, we've been lucky that they've just seen that we're genuine dudes. We, we know the sport well. Yeah. We're interested in promoting them in a positive light. And I think that so they're not like, hey, you know, how many how many Twitter followers you do? What is this going to get me? Yeah. They're interested in communicating their story to, to people that are passionate about promoting it, yeah. you know? Yeah, really. it's pretty wild, man. <laughs> so again, let's go. Sort of go back to how you. Um, I'm interested in hearing more about how you how you grew your, your viewership. You started by saying that you know you went on the forums. You got a whole bunch of good word of mouth there. Did have you used social media a lot? Have you have you ever really marketed yourself or had somebody help you market yourself? I, ne I never had anybody help me, but mostly I was just posting on Facebook the forums, and I still kind of do the same thing. Yeah, 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 and I haven't been like really keeping up with my website. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of work, yeah. man. It's a lot of work. You know, I'm, I'm going through the process myself of uh, you know setting up and managing a, like a top level, you know, a top level website. If you're on, if you've got your Facebook page, your Twitter account, your Instagram, your YouTube channel, it's all a lot of work, man. Yeah. And it's like, and you know, people don't realize that this process right here of putting together the content is huge and my process is simpler than yours i mean here i have a laptop and a microphone you know you've got mics you've got lights you've got camera work 
editing and video, all that takes a lot of time. You got to do a ton of blends, a ton of effects. Yeah. You know, so what's the part of the process that you enjoy doing the most? I like editing the most. Like, yep. once I, uh, after I got all the footage filmed and once I'm putting it together, that's like the, my favorite part is editing. Filming is, is cool too, but editing is still like my favorite out of everything. So for example, like Phuket Dreaming, are you just a one-man army on it or how does yeah, that work? pretty much. Boyd helps out a lot too though. Like he helps out yep. with the, like uh, transportation, setting up scenes and like stuff like that. Like he's like my, kind of like my partner on the shit. Now, do you find that, uh, do you find you could use more help? Like, I mean, because there's always, yeah. you can always probably always use, use more, more help, yeah. you know? <laughs> But yeah. how, did, did sometimes the shit happen? Did things go wrong? Yeah, a, lot I mean, of shit, a lot of shit goes wrong and happens. Like it'd be a lot easier if I had like you know, yeah. maybe like one or two more people. Like even just one person helping me out. Like, yeah, just a good assistant, the, like, right? Yeah, just like with the sound and like stuff like that. Cause, no, and I mean the thing is too is out here in Phuket, it's like if you're gear, you have a problem. Yeah, gear, you got a problem. You know, yeah. I had a problem with my mic and it caused an issue trying to record with you, and it's happened to it and a couple other times. And there's nothing more infuriating than that because it's not like you're in the middle of a, you know Manhattan or LA or yeah. where there's stores all over the place, and you, you can, can just go return it, return it, down, or yeah. or get something new or get something different. Yeah. You know, you're out here with the limited material that you have, and it, and it you don't really have an option for failure. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I mean, it was crazy, man. My mic wasn't working, and all I had to do was switch the USB cable. But if, if it would have been a problem with the mic or with the software or the laptop, you would have to, like, I would have literally been like, okay, is this game over? You know? So, <laughs> yeah, I haven't had any crap. You had any, any crap. Like, I mean, video gear, though, you can probably find some stuff on yeah, it, right? Yeah, you can find, like, most of the, like, the camera lenses and all that type of shit. Yeah, yeah. But out here, mostly, I've only had, like, a problem with, like, sound a couple times where, like, my mic would, like, crap out. Like now I'm working with the mic as like only one level. Hit me up, dude. I'm the sound. I'm the, I'm the only sound guy around here, right? <laughs> yeah. So what's uh, what's going to keep you? I mean, how long are you out here in Phuket till? Uh, till the middle of June. Eight episodes of uh, Phuket. Of Phuket yeah, June. Okay. How much? How long is the production of each episode? Each episode usually like uh, it depends because we we film a lot of stuff. So like uh, like right now I got enough film for like about six episodes. Okay. And then but I'm editing like the third one right now, so that's like. Okay. And usually editing takes like two, three weeks for each episode, and it all depends on the film schedule too. So I can't like really see how long each yeah, episode yeah. would do. Like, so when you get back to Miami, what's on the uh, what's on the agenda? Back to Miami, I'm gonna. I'm, I don't know. I'm not 100 percent sure yet. I'm probably gonna do a documentary first, like on uh, some street stuff in Miami, well, okay. outside of MMA, and then and then hopefully like work on a movie next. Like so you're looking to branch outside of, of yeah, MMA? Yeah. Because pretty much everything you've done has been yeah, MMA related yeah. right till now, right? This okay. is like it's pretty much my last MMA project. Wow. Look at dreaming. <laughs> Dude, that's wrong. No, no, no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you doing <laughs> some stuff. Can't talk about that yet, but you're not done. <laughs> okay, well, I will be like the godfather, man. I will draw <laughs> you back in. Um, do, you, do you still, I mean, is it, do you feel like you've just saturated is MMA just something you've been there done that do you still feel enthusiastic about it or do you just really have some other things that have some bucket lists like what are some of the things you'd like to accomplish as a filmmaker yeah like bucket list type shit pretty much I want to start uh, doing movies pretty much next and I want to like I have to branch off from MMA I'll probably do like an MMA movie at one point or something but yep I definitely got. I mean, write. it could almost be a good way to seg into yeah, film into film, yeah. fiction. I guess is by yeah. doing somewhat of an MMA themed thing. I mean, you could probably get a lot of, of cool people to help you out, and that would yeah. provide some. Yeah, because I can get a lot some of like, notable characters. <laughs> you know, characters in the movie that people will recognize and stuff. Yeah, like. and I mean, and there's been a bunch of those. I mean, a lot of it's a bunch of straight to DVD crap. <laughs> but uh, see, I don't want to get on that level either. Like, I want to. I at least want it to be good, like decent enough for people to like want to watch it. Yeah, want to buy it and like get into and it. not just feel like it's yeah, some just some shitty slap the other thing with yeah. a bunch of dudes that you've that seen fight act. that they can't act. <laughs> do you find uh, do you feel like there's some some MMA fighters who can act? Yeah, there's like a couple that are like uh, there's this dude Jess Leon is a French fighter. Yeah, he's I know the name. Fighting UFC, he's like a, he's a pretty good actor. Like okay, he's a really good actor. I think and then like. Uh, I think I could use Rob Messina to act. Yeah, I think yeah, Rob could. Sure. Uh, Rob could be there. He just <laughs> he yeah, could he, he could be in character. Like a, some, villain, <laughs> some villains. <laughs> yeah, and I think Junie could too. Man. Yeah, Junie could probably play too some shit too. <laughs> That'd be fucking funny, man. <laughs> There's a lot of fighters and stuff with personality that you can like put in certain roles that that would fit perfect. I think. Now, what are some of the genres of of films that you think that you'd like to dabble into or, or make movies about? Like, what are your preferred genres? Uh, crime. 
kind of like heat type movies. Wow, like, dude, that's my favorite <laughs> movie of all time. Yeah, so that's crazy. Is that same, your favorite yeah, movie? My favorite movie of all time. Like, that's crazy, man. Hands down. <laughs> yeah, I just think that that's one of the most complex, incredibly deep movies on so many levels. Yeah, and it's like, the type of movie you can just get something new from it every single time you watch yeah. it. And yeah, talk about a deep, casting, yeah. my God. Every single, every single actor in that movie just dialed it in. Yeah, I mean, that's like Val Kilmer's best point. movie. That's, I don't care. Ah, Pacino <laughs> and De Niro, I mean, they've done Pacino's, so many good yeah. things. I think De Niro's, yeah, I don't know. De Niro, that's one of his better movies, I think, too, because the way he plays that character yeah. is pretty, like, cold and straightforward. Because Pacino has, I think Pacino has a better body of work than De Niro. Yeah, yeah. You know, and De Niro, uh, De Niro and him in that movie, they, they, they only have that one scene. Well, they have a couple scenes together. Well, they, that's, they, like, the main... Yeah, that's a good scene though. That's fucking incredible. And it was funny because there was a lot of talk. I mean, we're talking about that the scene in the cafe, right? Yeah. Where they actually had that conversation, and uh, a lot of it is shot back and forth yeah. the way it's edited. And they try and to say that they weren't really in the same. Yeah, yeah. but no, <laughs> no, they were. Like they I think were. so. Yeah. No, and then and there's I, you know there's been production books made yeah, where you can see them. And I think there there is a sh- there must be a shot at one point that shows both of them. No. No, but there's like a photo. There really, there's a photo that shows them. Like side to side, but usually when they show both of them, it's like the back of Pacino's head, yeah, or the back of De Niro's head, like so you can kind of like. And even as an audio guy, that movie, I mean, that that's the music, the soundtrack, everything. <sighs> the soundtrack, it's on point. I remember Mob Deep; they sampled that, they sampled uh, yeah. the music and made a dope uh, track out of that. In, the, made a dope instrumental out of that, uh, <laughs> that title track. Yeah, um, the guy moving over the water track, yeah, that shit is dope. And uh, and just the audio from the, the shootout. I mean, the shootout was just insane. Yeah, like you know, and I've talked that. to a lot of people who are. My brother was ex-military and stuff, and he was just like the way that they move in this scene, the way that they cover and flank, the way that they hold the guns, the way that the guns sound in that setting. You know, of kind of like an open freeway in downtown LA, and he was just like, everything is credible. Everything. I always love the, the sound of the shootout. Like I've never seen in a movie where they have the gunshot sounds like so like real so vivid and on yeah, point. Yeah. like that shit puts you into the fucking uh, and it starts at shootout. the beginning of the movie when there's that first you know they lay out those uh, those spikes yeah. on the ground and the guys that run over with the the, the diesel with the bank truck. the bank was it yeah. a bank vehicle yeah, it was like a they stole some bonds yeah. or whatever in the back yeah heats the heats a badass movie man yeah. and I don't think and I like Michael Mann's body of work but that is by far his yeah. best movie so Michael know? Mann's like one of my favorite directors like. What did you think of the Miami Vice movie he did with him? I liked it. Uh, everybody I need to hated watch it, it like, again. I need to watch it again. But my initial my initial <laughs> take on it was this this wasn't a, a really well finished product. You know? <laughs> always like because I was always a fan of Miami Vice. Like yeah. since I was a kid, so like I was gonna like the movie either way. Like yeah, yeah. So it was like it was pretty cool. I like the the cinematography from the movie, like the way he shot it. The music yep. in the movie is awesome too. Like some scenes are like kind of boring and stuff, but I just like the way it's like put together. So crime movies. What else? Crime, horror. I'm a huge horror buff. Slasher movies. And okay. I definitely want to do like that. That would probably be the first thing I do is a slasher movie. What's, uh, what are a couple of references of, of horror movies of yours that you liked? I like Halloween. Okay. Most Halloween. Did you like those remakes? Yeah, the remakes. I thought favorite. the remakes were I don't dope. like the originals because I was like too old by the time like I seen the originals. Well, it's funny when you go back to old horror movies too. And by that I mean like let's, you know, the Friday the 13th, it's the Nightmare that. on Elm Street, the Halloweens, you know, the classics. That level of horror just doesn't work anymore. Yeah, it's like, because <laughs> it's just what you're seeing here is just simply not. It's just what shocks, scares, and outrages people now has just exponentially know, exploded, high, yeah. right? Saucer. I love the Saw series. Yeah. I thought that was really innovative. I'm not saying that they're classics per yeah, se, but <laughs> I think in the last. It's weird because horror's kind of now ducked back under. I think yeah, in like the last two or like three years. Much. Whereas I think you had the Blair Witch Project that came out and did that created the whole handheld footage yeah. type thing and that exploded um the ring the ring was i think the ring was they finally made a sort of supernatural horror movie that, that resonated was with me because it was kind of scary like that was like the first because <coughs> most horror movies aren't scary anymore like i don't think like yeah i can't really get scared ring was a little bit scary like that was the only one that could well, it's kind of a creepy, a creepy ghost yeah. movie, and that and that that genre, the supernatural, kind of the religious based thing, didn't really work for me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there was the Ring, uh, Blair Witch Project, which I I think was incredible. I don't know about you. I mean, come on, I you're never, a, I never watched it. Oh man, come I on, you do, it, doing what you do, like I mean, that you know, you're basically self taught, and you you just learn on the fly. You've you've done a whole bunch of street level gritty MMA shit. You have to see the Blair Witch Project, dude. Yeah, Absolutely, make sure out. you do check that out. Um, and then Hostel. 
Yeah, Hostel. I like. Hostel was huge. Hostel was awesome. I like that. And uh, the second one was crap. Yeah. Terrible. The first one was good. And the first one was great. One, the third one was fucking. And then I think Saw really, really did some new things there as well. Yeah. You know that they kind of invented the the, the super villain in yeah, yeah. basically, basically a, you a, a mass murder, a serial killer super villain type. Yeah. You know. But I always like the slashers the most. Like I like Scream because I yep. grew up on Scream. Like that was like during my like when I was a kid and stuff. Scream was awesome. Scream, yeah, Scream 1 and Scream 2 because I thought were like good. The, you know, like, yeah, Scream 1 and 2 are the best ones. Well, and there's a lot of meta, there's a lot of meta text going on there, yeah, like you know, uh, of, different like, layers for people like ourselves that grew up on horror movies and that, have, you, can you know, at, yeah, old yeah, shit, can right. see the, all the references to other stuff and what it's trying to say and flip yeah. its, itself on its ass. Um, if you're a, you're obviously a huge horror movie fan, uh, I can recommend some great French horror movies. There's one called Martyrs. Got to see that. Heard of it, but I never watched it. Yeah, it's a it's a real cult classic. There's another one called Frontiers, like the word frontier, but with the S between parentheses at the end. I would sort of qualify that as a uh, as a Texas Chainsaw Massacre meets neo Nazi insanity. Yeah. Really, really good, incredible movie. Um, high tension, high yeah, tension. I've seen that, 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 that by Alexander Aja, one of my favorite directors, who did um, the remake of The Hills Have Eyes. Which, yeah, I like if you that haven't one seen too. that, like that's absolutely them. bananas as well. I like both of them. <laughs> um, High Tension is awesome because that shit keeps you on the edge pretty much the whole movie. Yeah, that's a really crazy one. And then one of the greatest French horror flicks, you got to see this one in French. In French, it's called À l'intérieur, which means inside. Oh, so, I, yeah. I've seen that. Have you seen Inside? Yeah, what did you think of that? Baby, yeah, that one was dope. Dude, that, was, that <laughs> movie from top to bottom, was, I mean, yeah. it had that, that, was, that actually had like world class French actors in it. I thought that the setting was unbelievable. The way that it ends is unbelievable. Yeah. The uh, all the prosthetic work was incredible. I mean, gory as hell, yeah. but it, done the tastefully, done, it was you know, good, and yeah, done it done like very very well. There's another one called um, Le Calvaire, which means the the ca- uh, how do you try, translate that to English? Is it the cal- Calvary? What does it call you? What, the path that Jesus walked, uh, you know, for his crucifixion. Was it called? The, I think it's called. Yeah, it's either the the, ca, the cavalry. I'm thinking. No, the cavalry is like, like the people, people who come, come, come and save, save you. <laughs> anyway, Le uh, Calvaire, C A L V A I R E. That's a really. Uh, it's like a journalist. I think gets kind of lost in the backwoods and ends up in a in a really really rural ass backwards town where people aren't all right in the head. Yeah. Uh, and bad things happen to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds so. <laughs> uh, that was good. Yeah, the French went on a tear for a while there. Uh, but yeah, martyrs, frontiers. High tension. Inside. Inside. Yeah, those ones are must-see. If you haven't seen Martyrs, get on Martyrs. That one's crazy as well. Yeah, I'll check that out, man. Right on, man. So, I mean, do you have any Do you have any sponsors? Like, like well, for the series, we have sponsors. Like, yes, yeah, so you have. We, so, Booster's still involved. Yeah, Booster, BJPin.com, Fitness Hanover. Okay. It's a German company that does, like, gear out of Germany. All right. And, uh... <laughs> yeah, there Booster. you go. Yeah, yeah, that's about it, I think. Okay. Those and the last thing I wanted, the last thing I wanted to ask you about for sure is, uh, I'm a big fan of your um, the documentary or the, the the highlight reel sort of tribute that you did to Fedor. Yeah. And I remember seeing in that movie, I was like, I was really shocked about some of the the, the exclusive footage. I mean, that's another thing that is kind of your signature is you're you're able to get footage for these these highlight reels or these tributes. Like, how have you gone about doing that? Yeah, for the highlight reels, I used to like, I used to search everywhere for like mad footage I used to always want to like use footage that nobody else used or like that nobody's really seen so I would like go where does that exist like before back in in the early time like uh, a while ago when I was doing it yeah because MMA wasn't as popular so it was hard to access like a lot of the footage like I used to get them off of like Japanese websites and different like Korean websites that would just only post them up in their countries and like, okay. download them and then I had like some of the fighters managers like Fedor's manager would used to send me a lot of footage of him in camp that they would film to like use on highlights and stuff like that how'd you build that relationship though I mean that obviously requires some trust I mean not everybody could just hit him up and be like hey send me a bunch of intimate sort of you know exclusive footage of you that we've never seen yeah like cause Fedor like uh, his manager used to post on the forums and stuff like that and when <laughs> okay. I did like the first highlight of him like his manager watched it and he like said he showed Fedor and like the whole team and all that yeah, yeah. and they liked it and like uh, he was like, uh, if I was ever doing anything again, he was just always like sending me through the underground, like right, messages right. with like photos and like videos and different stuff from their camps and stuff like that. So it sounds like for you, like pretty much for your whole career, like nurturing the communication with the fans at the ground level has has worked wonders for you. Yeah. Like, and that that's really been a pillar of your career. Yeah. It's basically, yeah, just keeping the trust with the fighters and like the fans. Yeah. And yeah, they usually give me good access. Like. 
That's cool, man. That's cool. No, it sounds like, I mean, you've managed to build a lot of trust and a lot of great relationships by just, you know, communicating with people, reaching out to them at a grassroots level, and then yeah. nurturing that, helping promote them. I mean, who doesn't want that, right? Yeah, true. <laughs> Very cool. It's good for both. Excellent. So how can fans uh, keep up to date on your work, Isaac? Uh, search me on YouTube. It's Genghis Khan Films. Okay. All my work is there. And right now, Phuket Dreamin's on Phuket Top Team's uh, YouTube channel, which is Phuket Top Team on YouTube. All right. And that's the best way. And check out my Instagram, too. Also, Genghis Khan Films. I just started that up trying to, like, build the online presence. Good. All right. Sounds good. Awesome, man. Well, listen, uh, Isaac, I'm a fan of your work. Uh, I hope we're going to be able to do some stuff together. I'd love to get some exclusive video, uh, you know, material for, for my site and what I'm doing. I think uh, we've got a pretty good idea that we've, uh, we've fleshed out in a short amount of time, and hopefully we can start, uh, start working on that uh, early summer. Yeah, for sure, man. Awesome, man. Like I said, Godfather style. We're going to drag you back in, man. Can't leave MMA until I'm done. <laughs> awesome, man. All right. Thanks, Isaac, man. thanks for coming through. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Uh, this was the Trash Talk MMA podcast. I'm your host, Antoine Pelletier, with my guest, MMA documentary maker, filmmaker, Isaac Kensington, better known as Genghis Khan. Make sure you hit up his YouTube channel and check it out. Subscribe to his, uh, his Instagram as well. And make sure you follow Trash Talk MMA on Twitter and Facebook as well. We're out of here. Peace. I don't want to hear it. Thanks for listening to the Trash Talk MMA podcast. Be sure to visit TrashTalkMMA.com. And don't forget to follow Antoine on Twitter at Trash Talk MMA. Let us know you're listening. Use hashtag Trash Talk MMA.